Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Two weeks ago in this chamber, I asked the First Minister about the scale of the crisis across Scotland's accident and emergency departments. The answers were not good enough. This week, it emerged that for the month of August alone, 5,000 patients spent more than half a day to be seen in A&E departments across the country. Waits of more than 12 hours for emergency treatment are completely unacceptable. Yet that is what is faced by thousands of Scots at hospitals right across the country. This government is presiding over the worst ever A&E waiting times in Scotland. So, First Minister, do you believe that the plans outlined by the Health Secretary on Tuesday will end these appalling waits? First Minister. Well, firstly, performance in our accident emergency departments is not good enough. Um, I have been candid about that, as has the Health Secretary. Our National Health Service is dealing with backlogs created by a COVID pandemic. Indeed, it is still dealing with the impact in, in many different ways of that COVID pandemic. So we continue to support the National Health Service to recover, um, and that includes accident emergency, as it does all parts of our National Health Service. Um, of course, it is incumbent on me to point out again that while there are big challenges in our NHS and in A&E departments, our A&E departments remain the best performing anywhere in the United Kingdom, which is down to the dedication and hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Down to the dedication and hard work of those uh, in our National Health Service. Of course, staff numbers at, uh, are at a record high across the NHS and investment is at a record high. So while I am not complacent, the Health Secretary is not complacent, yes, we do believe uh, that the measures he set out in terms of the recovery plan update and indeed the winter plan uh, will make a positive uh, difference. Uh, finally, Presiding Officer, um, it is frankly uh, it beggars belief uh, that Douglas Ross stands here uh, today and talks about the National Health Service because I think his concern for the National Health Service today is even less convincing than it normally is because of course he spent much of the last week arguing for us uh, to take millions of pounds and put uh, that into the pockets of the richest people in our society regardless of the impact that would have on our National Health Service. Douglas Ross. First Minister, please don't ever question my commitment to our National Health Service when it was just over when it was when it was just over a year ago I had to follow my wife in an ambulance as she gave birth. When it was just over a year ago that I had to see my infant child on oxygen and fed through a tube in Aberdeen Sick Kids Hospital. Don't make political points out of this when politicians are raising serious issues. Because just like last year, when the UK Armed Forces had to step in to help, we are seeing this crisis spread throughout Scotland's NHS. Long waiting times in A&E have a knock-on effect on the rest of our health system. Mm -hmm. uh, a Freedom of Information request that we have received shows that ambulances are queuing up outside hospitals because of the crisis inside in A&E. In Glasgow earlier this year, one ambulance was stuck outside the hospital for more than 13 hours because the patient couldn't be admitted. 13 hours stuck outside. And the Press and Journal revealed today that in just the last month, ambulance turnaround times at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary were at a record high. This is critical time when ambulance could be deployed to help other patients. So, First Minister, if you could answer about Scotland's NHS and about Scotland's ambulances, can you tell us what your government is doing to prevent ambulances being held up outside hospitals? First Minister. Well, of course, £45 million for the Scottish Ambulance Service was part of the winter plan that was announced, um, and that is about Scotland's National Health Service. Can I say, uh, Presiding Officer, I have enormous sympathy for the personal experience of Douglas Ross, as I do for the personal experience of anyone uh, on the National Health Service. But I am sorry, Presiding Officer, um, I do think it is reasonable to question the commitment to the National Health Service of anybody who argues for millions of pounds of taxpayers' money to go 
to cutting taxes for the richest in our society yep. rather than be invested yep. in the National Health Service. It is because of this government's commitment to the National Health Service that we do not shy away from the difficulties that it is facing, largely because of the COVID pandemic that has placed these burdens on health services across the world. Uh, but that is why we are investing in our National Health Service uh, instead of giving tax cuts to the richest in our society. That is why we are supporting uh, greater recruitment in our National Health Service, staffing numbers at an all-time high. Uh, and of course, why uh, we are seeking a fair pay deal uh, with those who work in our National Health Service, because they do deserve it. So we will continue to do the hard work to support our National Health Service in tough times as well as in good times. And finally, presiding officer, we will take no lessons from the UK uh, government who are doing real damage, real damage to the National Health Service. Our NHS faces challenges, but Thank on any waiting times and on many other measurements, Scotland's National Health Service is the best performing in the UK, and that is down to the dedication of those who work within it. Douglas Ross. The First Minister has been busy all week on Twitter and responding to events elsewhere, but people actually turned to First Minister's question time to hear the First Minister and her government being challenged and hopefully hear responses, but there has been absolutely nothing. So let me go back to the topic that I am focusing on today, even if the First Minister will not in her responses. Because in the FOI that I mentioned, it was also revealed that the unacceptable time people are waiting for ambulances to even arrive is getting worse and worse. Amber incidents involve patients who need an ambulance within 19 minutes. They've called, they need someone within 19 minutes. And we found one individual in our FOI from Ayrshire and Arran who was categorised as an Amber incident who waited more than 32 hours. 32 hours is more than 100 times longer than the wait he was supposed to have of 19 minutes. And the situation is also dire for those facing the most serious incidents. They are categorised as purple incidents. They are so serious that the target response time is eight minutes. But this summer, one purple incident patient in the Lothians waited more than two hours for an ambulance. Another in Glasgow waited more than an hour and a half. Others have waited close to an hour in Lanarkshire, Forth Valley, in Highlands, in Ayrshire, in Shetland. These are the most critical incidents and people's lives are on the line. They are waiting for hours when the response should be in minutes. So First Minister, can you honestly stand there and tell us that these incidents are not jeopardising people's lives. First Minister. I have been and will continue to be entirely candid uh, that instances like that are not acceptable. Our NHS is under extreme pressure, which is why it's so important that we continue to take the steps we are taking to support it. Um, Douglas Ross is just plain wrong, as anybody listening to this will know, to say I did not address uh, the issues about Scotland's NHS in my previous answers. I spoke about the £45 million of additional investment into the Scottish Ambulance Service to help specifically with winter pressures. I spoke about record investment. I spoke about uh, record numbers of staff, looking in particular at the staffing of the Scottish Ambulance Service up under this SNP government by 67.3%. Uh, uh, so that is the reality. Uh, any instance such as those uh, narrated by Douglas Ross is clearly unacceptable. Uh, but our ambulance crews responded to over 68% of their highest priority calls in under 10 minutes and over 99% of their highest priority calls in under 30 minutes. That's what the dedication of our paramedics and our ambulance technicians are uh, delivering. So we will continue to support our National Health Service uh, in the ways that I have outlined. But, presiding officer, it is not possible uh, to separate these issues from the overall funding of our National Health Service, which, like the overall funding of Scotland's budget, is dependent on decisions taken by the Government at Westminster. Uh, we have already uh, had, of course, the U-turn in terms of tax cuts for the richest 1% of people 
uh, in the country, which Douglas Ross this time last week wanted this government to emulate, which would have taken millions of pounds out of the budget of our public services. Uh, and finally, we had thank you, last week. Thank you. If we could hear the first minister, we had last week the former. Uh, Deputy Governor, I think, of the Bank of England, saying that the spending cuts that are coming down the track from the Tory UK government could mean the end of the National Health Service as we know it. So that is the reality. This government will continue to prioritise the National Health Service, but we are doing that in the face of a Tory government that seems intent on destroying the National Health Service. Douglas Ross. We would all really benefit across Scotland if Nicola Sturgeon spent more of a Thursday morning practising her responses to the issues that really matter to people in Scotland, rather than political attacks. Because the, the First Minister, because the First Minister has to accept and must see that the situation is appalling in our NHS with ambulance waiting times, and it's happening all over the country. The First Minister said I was narrating cases. So let's look at a case that we both should know about. On Monday, the First Minister and I were both emailed by a 78-year-old man explaining what recently happened to his 73-year-old wife. This was on Monday and we both got this email. His 73-year-old wife fell in their garden and broke her hip. She was in agony, but was told a broken hip doesn't constitute a priority to receive an ambulance. They waited for hours for that ambulance to come to take them to Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, but it never arrived. After four and a half hours, outside, in the garden, in agony, in pain, in distress, from 10 to 3 in the afternoon to half past 7 at night, they eventually gave up and called a taxi. The 78-year-old man had to get help from his neighbours to lift his wife into the taxi to eventually get her to hospital. A line in this email we both received, First Minister says, she endured even more severe pain getting into the taxi, but by this time we were getting desperate. First Minister, the email also says from this gentleman that your government should, and I quote him, hang your heads in shame. He's right, isn't he? First Minister, he's absolutely right. Uh, that experiences like that are not acceptable and nobody will ever hear me say uh, otherwise. Uh, our health service, including our ambulance service, is under the most extreme pressure that most of us can ever remember. And I do believe that most people understand the reasons for that. I also believe that most people understand the support that is being given to the National Health Service and it is right and proper that that is the case. Record staffing at levels in our NHS, record investment, at the winter plan that the Health Secretary set out in this chamber earlier this week. Uh, so we will continue to get on with the very serious responsibility of supporting the recovery of our National Health Service. We will always uh, respond to instances uh, where people's experiences uh, are not what they should be, and we will not shy away from that. But this government prioritises and supports the National Health Service, uh, and we will continue to do so each and every single day. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Presenting officer, the Scottish Government's failure to get to grips with the NHS waiting times is costing lives. In February, my colleague Faisal Chowdhury raised the case of Anne Sinclair, who was waiting for cancer treatment. Anne, a previous cancer survivor, waited seven months for a diagnosis, at which point she was told she had an aggressive form of cancer. She was then forced to wait more than five months for treatment. We know that the sooner you are diagnosed and the sooner you start treatment, the more likely you are to survive. Anne tragically died this summer. Her last words to her son, Ricky, were, keep fighting, tell my story. We need to stop this happening to anyone else. I love you. First Minister, in February, you said Anne's case was unacceptable, a word you've used at least six times already this afternoon. If it's, un if it's unacceptable, why is it still happening to others? First Minister. Well, firstly, I want to convey uh, my sincere condolences uh, to Anne's loved ones, uh, to her family and her friends. Uh, obviously, I, I don't know uh, all of the circumstances 
uh, of her situation, but I do know uh, what was narrated to me in the Chamber uh, previously. Uh, it is the case uh, that individual uh, experiences where uh, the treatment uh, or the care on the NHS is not what all of us expect, and that is unacceptable, and I'm never going to stop saying that. Uh, that does not change the fact that for the overwhelming majority of people in this country, the NHS delivers an outstanding service. Cancer is a clinical priority. Cancer uh, should always be a clinical priority. We have uh, two key uh, waiting times uh, standards on uh, the NHS for cancer care. Uh, for the 31-day uh, decision to treat to first uh, treatment uh, and the 62-day uh, target. Uh, more people now uh, than has been the case before are being seen uh, on those urgent pathways uh, and we continue to invest in cancer services and we continue to invest, of course, in the early diagnosis of cancer. So these uh, issues are uh, a priority. I don't shy away from, I will never shy away uh, from the serious uh, challenges and pressures on our National Health Service. That is why it is so incumbent uh, on government to support the National Health Service with the investment and the other forms of support that it needs, and we will always uh, do that for the sake of patients uh, like Anne uh, and, of course, the many other patients who depend on the National Health Service each and every day. Anna Sarwar. Presenter, Anne's case isn't an isolated one or an individual one. Here's another. A 56-year-old man in Western Bartonshire first went to his doctor with back pain in autumn 2020. He was prescribed pain kindles and told to visit a physio. Six months later, he was passing blood and being violently sick. He called an ambulance, but was told twice that they wouldn't attend because his condition wasn't life-threatening. So he got himself to A&E and eventually had a CT scan. It showed a large tumour that had spread to his spine. He died a year after first seeking help from the NHS. This demonstrates a systemic failure and what happens when services and staff are pushed to breaking point. First Minister, do you accept that your failure to get to grips with the NHS crisis is costing lives? First Minister. I take my responsibility to the NHS seriously every single day. The pressures on our NHS are well known. That is why the support we are giving to our NHS is so important. Mm. Uh, that is the case uh, across all conditions uh, and all specialties in our National Health Service, but perhaps uh, even more particularly the case when it comes to cancer uh, care. Uh, I mentioned the two targets earlier on. Uh, in terms of the 31-day target, which to explain to people is the time uh, from a decision taken to treat uh, to the first treatment happening, uh, more than 95% uh, of patients are seen within that target. The 62-day uh, uh, target, which is uh, the whole referral uh, to treatment that is much more challenging uh, but uh, almost eight out of ten are seen within that target and more people are being seen through that uh, urgent pathway than has ever been the case before now the reason um, i spent time talking about that is it is important i think for people to understand that for the vast majority our nhs on cancer care and on everything else delivers an outstanding uh, service of clinical care Clearly, that is not the case for everyone, particularly now given the pressures faced. That's why the responsibility I have, the Health Secretary has, uh, and the whole government has to make sure we are supporting the NHS is such a vital one and one that we take so incredibly seriously. Anna Sarwar. A failure to get to grips with the NHS crisis is costing lives. And let's look at the facts. In the past year, 3,393 people waited more than the 62-day standard for urgent cancer treatment, a standard not met in 10 years and getting worse. That means lives lost. The worst a &E waiting times on record. In one month alone, 13,000 patients waited over eight hours. The Royal College of Emergency Medicine have warned that that means lives lost. This is a systemic failure on the SNP's watch. Staff are being failed, patients are being let down, Lives are being lost. How many more families have to suffer? How many more tragic stories do we have to bring to this parliament before Nicola Sturgeon and Hamza Youssef do their jobs? First Minister. Firstly, Presiding Officer, on the 62-day uh, cancer target, 
Um, if we look at the most recent quarter, more patients were treated on that 62 day pathway uh, than was the case uh, before uh, the pandemic. In the uh, last year that we have full year figures for, uh, more uh, people uh, were treated on that 62 uh, day pathway than I think uh, in any year since 2011. So our National Health Service, because of the investment, because of the recruitment of staff, is doing uh, more in many senses than it was before. Demand uh, is also increasing, uh, which is why we've got to continue to increase that support. So whether it's on uh, cancer care or accident emergency or ambulance service uh, response times, as uh, we have just been talking about, yes, there are very significant challenges. Those uh, challenges are often experienced by patients and they are felt every day by the staff who work in the front line of our National Health Service. But this is a government committed to supporting our National Health Service. There has never been a more difficult time to do so, but there has also never been a more important time to do so, and that's why we continue to take that responsibility so seriously. Move to constituency and general supplementaries, and I call Cocab Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'd like to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that some ethnic minority teaching professionals have experienced racist online abuse after sharing their plans for more diversity in Scottish education at the Scottish Learning Festival. And will the First Minister join me in condemning the racist abuse faced by St Albert's Primary in her constituency and the racist graffiti that has been found on Glasgow University campus in my constituency? Will she further agree with me that anti-racist education is important for ensuring a more diverse and inclusive Scotland? First Minister. <clears throat> I wholeheartedly agree with that and uh, I'm sure the whole chamber wholeheartedly agrees with that. No one uh, should ever experience racism and all of us have a duty uh, to stand firmly in solidarity uh, with anyone who does uh, and against uh, those who are uh, racist. The, the vile racist abuse uh, that was directed at teaching professionals, uh, staff and children on the back of the Scottish Learning uh, Festival should be condemned and I do condemn it. Um, let me uh, make comment, uh, particularly given how close to my own heart uh, it is the experience of uh, pupils at St Albert's Primary in my own constituency uh, of Pollock Shields. Uh, St Albert's is a school I know very well. Um, it's a fantastic school with a fantastic head teacher, fantastic teachers and utterly outstanding uh, young people. Um, I was privileged uh, on Friday to visit that school as I have been so many times in the past. Uh, racism always sickens me, but there is nothing that turns my stomach more uh, than the idea of adults, uh, whether they're from Scotland or anywhere else in the world, uh, that can look at a photograph of beautiful, clever children and only see the colour of their skin. It is despicable, it is disgusting, it has no place in Scotland, and I hope all of us unite in utter condemnation of vile racists everywhere. <laughs> Graham Simpson. Thank you. The First Minister will know that next week is Baby Loss Awareness Week. I have a fantastic charity in my region, Baby Loss Retreat, which helps people who have lost babies. I opened their shop in Airdrie recently. Heather Denham of East Kilbride works for them after being helped by them, and she's in the public gallery today. Um, Heather has an eight-year-old son, but she's lost three other children. In April last year, she went for her 20-week scan and found her baby daughter had no heartbeat. Heather had to give birth to little Georgia and then lay her to rest a few days later. But because Georgia was born at less than 24 weeks, she has no birth certificate. And Heather told me, one of my children has a birth certificate, the other does not. My daughter does not exist in the eyes of the law, and it breaks my heart every single day. I've held two children in my arms, so they should both exist in the eyes of the law. The UK Government has launched a new initiative which will provide parents with a pregnancy loss certificate if their baby is born before 24 weeks. So my question for the First Minister is, will she ensure that the same happens here? First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I will. Um, 
Baby Loss Awareness Week is uh, a very important uh, event every year. It's, uh, it's an event I always mark personally, uh, as well as, uh, as First Minister, for uh, very personal uh, reasons. Um, so I absolutely understand uh, the feelings and the sentiments that have been uh, narrated uh, in the Chamber today. Um, I know from personal experience uh, how awful it is uh, to lose a baby uh, very early on, uh, and I know uh, how deep the desire is to have uh, that uh, lost baby uh, recognised in uh, a whole variety of ways. So I, I do think uh, the suggestion around uh, pregnancy loss certificates is an important one, um, and I will give the undertaking that we will look very seriously at that in Scotland too. Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In uh, recent hours, reports have emerged that the Centre for the Moving Image, the charity that runs both the Belmont Cinema in Aberdeen and the Film House in Edinburgh, has gone into receivership. The Film House is an important institution located in Edinburgh Central, but it's an important institution for the whole of the city and indeed the whole of the country, hosting the Edinburgh International Film Festival, which is the oldest continuously running film festival in the world. So can I ask the First Minister, uh, what efforts the government will be making? Will she ask ministers to engage with Aberdeen and Edinburgh City Council uh, so that they can coordinate an approach? And what uh, uh, both business and cultural support funds can be made available in order to save this vitally important cultural institution? Thank you. First Minister. Well, firstly, can I thank Daniel Johnson for raising uh, this issue. Uh, this news, which of course has emerged publicly this morning, is uh, of huge concern. Uh, and I know many people in Edinburgh and Aberdeen uh, will be profoundly uh, upset about it. Uh, these are really important cultural organisations and all of us uh, want to see them, if at all possible, go from strength to strength. Uh, the Scottish Government will uh, engage to consider whether there is any support we can bring to bear. I will ask uh, Angus Robertson uh, to engage uh, with Aberdeen and uh, Edinburgh City Councils um, and uh, ensure that Creative Scotland, which of course uh, takes funding decisions independently of ministers, uh, engages with these organisations as well. Obviously, I cannot uh, give any commitment standing here right now and I can't go into any more detail ahead of that engagement. Uh, but I can say that we recognise the importance of these organisations and will do everything possible to support them at this difficult time. Michelle Thompson. Yesterday, the First Minister will have seen the truly shocking findings by Glasgow University and the Glasgow Centre for Population Health, published in the Journal of Epidemiology and Community Health, that 19,299 excess deaths in Scotland were likely to have been caused by UK government economic policy. The academics also report that this translates into 300,000 deaths across the UK, deaths that lie squarely at the door of the Tories. Does the First Minister therefore agree that it is essential for the protection of our population's health that Scotland must escape Westminster control and the Tories for good and that this can only be guaranteed with independence. First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I do. Uh, this study that was published this week by the Glasgow Centre for Population Health uh, was shocking and really lays bare uh, the real impact of austerity, the impact on uh, people's lives, uh, quite literally, uh, as we saw in, in this report. Um, of course, uh, this was a report into the impact of past Tory austerity. Uh, we now face, unfortunately, a new period of Tory austerity. We have seen in recent days uh, the estimate of what spending cuts uh, will be, and we know the impact that will have on our public services um, and on people's lives. Uh, we are watching a debate in the Conservative uh, Party, a quite grotesque debate about whether or not it is right to cut the incomes of people on benefits uh, the lowest uh, paid people in our society. Uh, so yes, uh, if we do want uh, to chart a different course in Scotland, if we do want uh, to apply the values of respect uh, and dignity in Scotland, as I believe most of us across this chamber do, then we are not going to be able to do that as long as we are tied to Westminster governance. It is one of many, many uh, reasons why this country needs to be independent and why I believe this country will be independent. Liam Kerr. Presiding officer, last weekend it was reported that the Scottish Government's capital spending review intends to cut 14 per cent, that's over 17 million, from the funding for energy efficiency measures for those in fuel poverty. 
Now, of course, it's right we focus on immediate measures to help families through the cost of living crisis, but investment in efficiency upgrades will reduce their heating bills and energy use in the long run. Now, the Scottish Government declined to confirm or deny those cuts, so I wonder if the First Minister might now confirm whether the cuts will go ahead as set out. First Minister. Now, we have a, an emergency budget review underway right now. The Deputy First Minister will report the outcome of that to Parliament following uh, the recess. Uh, I wish we weren't having to undertake an emergency budget review. Yeah. We are having to do that because of the actions of the UK yeah. Conservative yeah. Government. Uh, we have an effectively fixed uh, budget. We have uh, very limited powers to borrow. Uh, and therefore, given that our budget is being eroded uh, by soaring inflation, and given that we are facing cuts, uh, even more cuts coming down the track from Westminster, there are some very, very difficult decisions that we have to contemplate. But we will take those decisions, applying our values, and seek to protect those who need our protection most. Uh, but if Tory members don't want us to have to face some of these choices, and I wish we didn't have to face those choices, uh, then perhaps instead of kowtowing uh, to their masters in London over tax cuts to the rich, they could actually start standing up for Scotland and demanding fair budget treatment for this Parliament. Paul Sweeney. Officer. Last week, Plada ceased production at the McVitie's factory in Toll Cross, ending 205 years of biscuit making in Glasgow and terminating the connection of an iconic Scottish brand with our country. Workers faced the humiliation of having to walk out of their last shifts, whilst the state of the art machinery they worked on was being dismantled around them to be shipped to other factories in England. Some of that machinery was funded by almost a million pounds in Scottish Enterprise grants. So has the government raised concerns with Pladis management about their blatant asset stripping of the Glasgow factory? And what steps are they taking to secure this factory and its assets for future manufacturing use? First Minister. Well, Scottish Enterprise will consider uh, all of these issues. I, uh, like the member, was extremely uh, disappointed that the, the tireless efforts, and I think uh, everybody would recognise uh, that those efforts were tireless of the Pladis Action Group, were not able to secure the future of the Toll Cross site and its skilled workforce. That was not for the want of trying. Uh, my thoughts are with the staff and their families, who are now, of course, facing a redundancy situation, and the Scottish Government uh, will support them in every uh, way possible. Uh, but I do hope uh, the member will accept that the Scottish Government uh, did everything possible to try to reach a different outcome, and I think we all regret that that was not possible. Question number three, Stephanie Callaghan. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to curb the reported sharp rise in e-cigarette use amongst teenagers. First Minister. Well, we're greatly concerned by reports of young people obtaining e-cigarettes or vaping products. Uh, simply the only place for vaping should be as a possibility to help existing smokers quit using tobacco. Underpinning our concern is the clear evidence uh, that shows vaping products are not harm-free. Uh, this is married with our concern about the involvement and influence of the tobacco industry with vaping. Uh, last week, we published our consultation analysis on proposed restrictions on vaping products, and the Public Health Minister is aiming to bring forward the new regulations in the new year. Stephanie Callaghan. I thank the First Minister for her answer. A recent consultation titled Tightening Rules in Advertising and Promoting Vaping Products produced polarised views. However, with major Scottish football clubs signing partnerships with vaping companies and reports of TikTok influencers platforming these products to young people online. We need decisive action to control this crisis before it spirals out of control. Can the First Minister confirm if further considerations have been given to stricter regulations around the sale and marketing of e-cigarette products, both online and offline, together with the development of an effective, clear, educational public health message, which addresses this new epidemic of nicotine addiction in children and young people? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do agree with the sentiments of that question. Uh, we're considering the outcome of the consultation carefully. We've not ruled anything out at this stage. Any action uh, we do seek to take will be building on the regulations that are already in place that restricts the marketing, promotion and sale of vaping products to under 18s. Uh, we recognise the vital importance of having a clear public health message for young people around the potential dangers of vaping, uh, which is why we're working with the Young Scot and the Children's Parliament to bring their voices into our work to develop a refreshed tobacco action plan. So we are determined to create a smoke-free Scotland uh, where nicotine addiction is a thing of the past. 
Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask First Minister if data collected from the local schools survey on the question of youth vaping will be collated and considered in the Scottish Government's Tobacco Action Plan, which is due to be published next year? First Minister. Um, yes, it will be. We have a stated ambition to create a, a tobacco-free generation in Scotland by 2034, um, and we will therefore consider how such a survey on vaping can help to deliver that ambition. Question number four, Stephen Kerr. To ask the First Minister what discussions she has had with the UK Government about new investment zones for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, the Secretary of State for Leveling Up wrote to the Deputy First Minister proposing official discussions on how investment zones might work in Scotland. We have agreed to exploratory discussions, but we have also emphasised that any model would require partnership working between the Scottish and UK governments, that it must reflect the Scottish economic policy and governance landscape, and must respect the devolution settlement, particularly as it relates to planning and environmental protection. We still await further information on the UK's proposals. Stephen Kerr. Well, I welcome uh, the positivity of the First Minister's response. And I welcome the proposal to create investment zones in Scotland as one part of an ambitious plan to grow our economy, to incentivise businesses to invest, to build and to create high quality jobs. And I also welcome the reported constructive talks that have just been mentioned between Scottish ministers and the British government. But for my constituents, the people of central Scotland, and for people in businesses right across Scotland, the success of this policy will depend on Scotland's two governments working cooperatively together for the common good. And that common good is to work together to attract new investment, new infrastructure, and new high skill and high paid jobs. Now, I've read that there could be as many as five or more investment zones created in Scotland. So will the First Minister set aside constitutional division, be ambitious for Scotland, and work in partnership with the UK government to bring the benefits of investment zones not only to the people of central Scotland, but to other parts of Scotland as well. First Minister. Well, Presiding Officer, it's uh, good to hear a Tory take a break from crashing the economy to talk about supporting the economy. Um, that is certainly a, a refreshing change, although I'm not convinced it will be a long-standing one. Uh, can I say to the Tories, anybody who's really serious about growing the economy uh, needs to tackle the uh, anti-growth coalition within the Conservative Party, you know, the ones that took Scotland out of the European Union and the single market, and the ones who are exacerbating skill shortages uh, through their obsession with immigration. So perhaps uh, it would support the economy to start there. On investment zones, uh, Presiding Officer, I'm not sure if Stephen Kerr listened to what I said. Uh, we've agreed to exploratory discussions, uh, but we have to be satisfied that these are in Scotland's interest. But crucially, we don't have any detail yet of the UK government's proposals. I know the Scottish Tories, I know the Scottish Tories just do anything that UK uh, Tories ask them to do, but this government actually acts in the interests of the Scottish people, and that will be true on investment zones as it is on everything else. Question number five, Pam Duncan Glancy. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the Joseph Rowntree Foundation report, Poverty in Scotland 2022. First Minister. Uh, the report is a stark reminder of the pressures low income households are facing and why this Government's actions to tackle poverty are so important. Uh, we have allocated almost £3 billion this year to help mitigate the impact of increasing costs on households. Uh, and of course, that is from within our fixed budget, which is £1.7 billion less than it was in December due to inflation. Uh, and we're taking a range of actions, including, of course, increasing our unique Scottish child payment to £25 per week. Uh, this is in sharp contrast to a UK government plunging the UK into economic turmoil. Uh, we've seen over the past week and indeed uh, the past 12 years why it is so vital that this parliament has the full powers to be able to tackle poverty and the cost of living and support those most in need. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the First Minister for that answer, but the Joseph Rowntree Foundation report highlighted the particular pressures facing families in Scotland with a disabled person in them, noting that three out of four have experienced negative impact of poverty on their mental health, and even higher numbers have had to cut back on essential spending. Another report published this week by Inclusion Scotland made the very stark statement 
that there will be avoidable deaths of disabled people this winter without targeted action. Scottish Labour have pushed and pushed the Scottish Government to do something for disabled people during this cost of living crisis, and so far we have been ignored. What urgent action will this Government do to take steps, step in and alleviate the pressures facing disabled people this winter? First Minister. Well, firstly, it is the case that poverty impacts disproportionately on certain groups in our society, and that undoubtedly includes uh, disabled groups. The £3 billion that I spoke about, uh, of course, will be of benefit in many uh, respects. The Fuel Insecurity Fund, uh, as one example, uh, to those living with disabilities. And we will continue within the fixed budget that we have and within the limited powers that we have to do as much as we can to mitigate uh, against the cost of living crisis and the impact that it has. Uh, but of course, so many of these powers uh, and the access to resources lie out, out with the hands of this parliament. And that is the fundamental problem. It's not enough to have partial powers over uh, welfare. It's not enough to have partial resources. We need full powers in this parliament. And I hope we may yet see the day uh, where Labour argues for these powers not to be uh, with Tory governments at Westminster, but to be in the hands of this democratically elected parliament. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, First Minister, if you've got all this power, why are you taking away money from disabled people in regard to employment by cutting the budget for £53 million this year? And can you tell the Scottish people, and particularly disabled people, why is it harder for a disabled person in Scotland to get a job than it is anywhere else in the United Kingdom? First Minister. Daniel Officer, I think firstly it is really important to stress that the budget for employability is increasing. Yeah. It's not increasing by as much as we would like it to uh, because of the choices we are being forced to make because our budget is shrinking as a result of the economic incompetence and financial Absolutely. decisions yeah. of the UK Government. So if anybody in this Parliament uh, doesn't like uh, the decisions we are making, and we don't want to be in a position of having to make these decisions, uh, then they can come and argue uh, how else we should balance our budget and protect those most in need. And I'd say particularly to Conservatives, uh, if you don't like these decisions, then start uh, arguing with your colleagues at Westminster to stop cutting the budget of this Parliament so that some of these decisions are not necessarily in the first place. Question number six, Jamie Green. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to reduce deaths in custody, including suicides, in light of reports of a 60% year-on-year increase. First Minister. Uh, first and foremost, my thoughts are with everyone who has lost a loved one in prison custody. Uh, the safety and well-being of those in prison is a priority, and we recognise uh, that we need to do more to support positive health outcomes for vulnerable people in prisons. The Prison Health and Social Care Needs Assessment, which we published last month and work undertaken in response to the Independent Death and Custody Review, are key steps in our commitment to achieving this. All frontline staff are trained in the SPS Prevention of Suicide Strategy, which provides a person-centred care pathway for those at risk of suicide and promotes a supportive environment where people can ask for help. Individuals are screened upon arrival at prison and, when needed, the SPS and the NHS work together to support the individual eh, and review them regularly. Jamie Green. Uh, the First Minister is right. We do need to do more because in my hand is a one-page roll call and it's a tragic one-page piece of paper because it lists every single death in prison last year, their name, their age and their cause of death. And I won't name the names on this list out of respect for the families involved and the risk of re-traumatisation, but they shouldn't be forgotten. HMP Adiwell, a 26-year-old man, took his own life nine months into his sentence. HMP Kilmarnock, a 29-year-old man, four months into his sentence, found hanging. HMP Greenock, a 27-year-old man, found hanging 15 months into his sentence. And HMP Polmont, a 20-year-old man, also found dead. He wasn't even convicted. He was on remand. And these are just the tragic suicides in prisons. Where do I start with the overdoses, First Minister? It is a lamb. Opioid overdoses, multi-drug intoxication are killing people in our prisons on a weekly basis. 53 of them on this list last year alone. Ten years ago, there were 21. 
names on this list. That's still too many, but it's doubled in 10 years. I only want to ask this to the First Minister. Why are so many people still taking their lives in custody? And despite years of promises to get a grip on this, why are so many drugs still getting into our prisons and killing people? Because I warn, this has to stop, or next year this list will be two pages long, and the year after that it will be three pages long. When will this end, First Minister? First Minister, firstly, every, every death from suicide is a tragedy, no matter uh, where that takes place, which is why this is not specifically about prisons, but it's why the Scottish Government and COSLA new suicide prevention strategy that was launched last week is so important. Clearly, there are particular issues in prisons, which is why the work that I set out in my original answer is so important. Uh, the prevention of suicide in prison strategy aims to care for those at risk of suicide uh, by providing a specific pathway based on an individual's specific needs. And of course, uh, there should always be the promotion of a supportive environment where people in custody are able to ask for help. So we will continue to take forward all of that work. Uh, finally, this is also one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the many reasons uh, why this government has made it a priority to try to reduce the number of people, particularly the number of vulnerable people who are in our prisons in the first place, uh, by reducing short-term sentences, for example, by increasing community rehabilitation uh, options. And often the Conservatives come here and oppose all of these things. So can I say, in the interest, in the interest of consensus, that as we take forward this important debate, we do that in the context uh, of a proper debate about criminal justice uh, in the whole, uh, because we do send too many people in the first place in Scotland to prison, and we need to tackle that, as well as making sure we tackle the conditions inside our prisons. I'm Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Research from Glasgow University showed that in more than nine out of ten fatal accident inquiries Sheriffs made no recommendations to improve practice, but when families were involved, sheriffs were three times more likely to make findings based on lessons learned from their deaths. But only 31 per cent of families are represented at fatal accident inquiries. This is an issue that my colleague Katie Clark raised with the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, where we are asking you, First Minister, to consider whether all families and their next of kin, uh, for family members who have died in custody, should have access to non-means-tested legal aid funding throughout the process of the investigation. I am sure the First Minister will appreciate that many families who have lost someone in custody do feel intimidated by the process. They feel helpless, and I think it is important to make sure that they get representation where that is needed. First Minister. I think these are important and legitimate issues to raise. A fatal accident inquiry, of course, is an independent judicial process. It is mandatory for all deaths in custody unless the circumstances of the death have been explained through a criminal trial or other inquiry. Uh, the current process in place for fatal accident inquiries, uh, as enacted in legislation in 2016, it follows upon an in-depth review of the system. So there have been a number of improvements made in relation uh, to the system of fatal accident inquiries since the introduction of the, the legislation. Uh, clearly, the point Pauline McNeill uh, raises is an important one uh, about legal aid and the ability of families to engage uh, with inquiries. Uh, I will certainly take that away and consider uh, whether there is further action uh, that it would be appropriate for the Scottish Government to take. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Mark Ruskell, and there will be a short suspension to allow those leaving the Chamber and Public Gallery to do so.